On October 10th, 2002, Tom Udall, then congressman, was not alone. There were 132 other people who voted against the use of authorization of, of military force in Iraq, um, but you were in the minority. And that is something that uh, we are embroiled in, in wars throughout the Middle East, um, well, at least Afghanistan now, um, some 17 years later or coming up on that. And we are here today to talk about Iran, um, Iraq's neighbor. And uh, this is an issue that has um, been on your radar, but really since April, um, you've been active in, in trying not to um, trying to forestall a rush to war, I guess, maybe is a, a better way to phrase it. What are you doing yeah. and um, what is your concern? Yeah, well, I, I, I think the way you put it is, is perfect, rush to war, uh, because what we've seen go on with this administration is we had the Iran agreement, which was a very good agreement for not having nuclear weapons in the Middle East. And when you have a country agree to intensive inspection and then not get a nuclear uh, bomb and have the ability to know with a year breakout period, so one year to know whether they're doing it or not, that's pretty special. And we should have built on that. But the current administration took us out of that and then started this maximum pressure campaign putting all the pressure on Iran, its oil industry, and those kinds of situations. So we are now in a situation where we've sent troops in. Um, we're right face to face with, with many of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards or troops. Uh, there could be a miscalculation, we could be in the middle of war. And, and I think that should be the very last resort we ever uh, get into when we talk about Iraq or, or Iran or any country. Um, but it looks like this administration is putting us on uh, the brink of war right now. And so we're trying to get a vote on that and say basically um, no money should be spent until you come to the Congress and come to the American people and say why you want to go to war and what the evidence is. Because I think the American people are sick and tired of these forever wars, the endless wars that are going on. Well, we now have uh, people eligible to serve in the military. Um, or will soon have people eligible to serve in the military who've never known anything but America at war. That's right, that's right. And that, and that conditions young people, Matt, to think that the solution to these problems around the country is war. And many times we know the solutions are much more in the diplomatic area, in the area we call soft power. Uh, it isn't, and I'm not critical at all of the military young people that are serving in any of these conflicts where we had bad judgment at the top and they were sent. You know, they are the best trained troops in the world. They do a very good job. They're heroic. Many of them have lost their lives. Uh, actually, one of the bills where we say pull out of Afghanistan, we give them a bonus, everybody that served, uh, just to make sure that we recognize uh, them for their service and the ultimate sacrifice that men and women in the military make. Um, you've introduced, just to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of this briefly, um, you, you're approaching this from a lot of different angles, but you've introduced a bill um, that seems like it's, it's in the um, Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate right now. Seems like it may not go anywhere. Um, you tried uh, to get an amendment tacked on to another bill um, that was voted down. You said 13 to, was it nine? Yeah. In, in yes. the Foreign Relations Committee. So now, um, you're looking at the defense bill and, yes. and thinking that perhaps you can at least get people on the record um, with uh, requiring congressional approval for, for military forces, that kind That's of... That's you've, you've hit it on the head. I mean, we, we, there was the Iran sanctions bill going through foreign relations. We tried to amend that. We were, it was 13 to nine, it was close, but we didn't get it over the mark. When that bill comes to the floor later, we may try to amend it. But the thing in front of us, because we have uh, this emergency situation, I think, over there where there could be miscalculation, the bill in front of us this week will be the uh, defense bill. And so we have filed an amendment, uh, and that amendment basically says no money shall be spent on a conflict until you come to the Congress, get us briefed on why you want to go to war, tell us what the intelligence is, and fully disclose, and then we have a debate about it, and then we make a decision. And so that's, that's the way it's supposed to work. Unfortunately, 
uh, with several presidents now, we're in this age of what I would call the imperial presidency, where the presidents go out and start wars, and then uh, Congress doesn't rein them in when it, it should be time to end those wars. The, the big example is Afghanistan, as you mentioned in your earlier question, 17 years in Afghanistan, and we're still there, and nobody can quite figure out why we're still there. You know, why, uh, I, I talk to young men and women and their parents and say, my, my young man, young woman is over there, they don't know what they're supposed to be doing there. And so, you know, I think we're, we're in a place where it's up to Congress to step up to the plate. Um, April of last year, um, uh, or, or thereabouts in 2018, um, President Trump said he was pulling out of, of that agreement. Um, in the months since, um, and, and recently, he has, um, he has designated the uh, Revolutionary Guard in Iran as a terrorist organization. That's something new for the U.S. Yes. Um, to designate a, a state uh, militia or an army as a, a terrorist group. Um, really stepping up the rhetoric just this morning, we hear Iran saying that they are going to um, try to enrich their uranium further, closer to weapons grade. Um, there's a lot to sift through here. Um, is your sense of what's going on now, is Iran looking for um, a way out of some of the economic sanctions, um, some wiggle room? I, I think Iran is trying to say in a number of different ways, we would be willing to sit down and negotiate and talk. And what I don't understand is why this administration hasn't taken them up on that. Well, we've heard the president say, I'm, I'm willing to talk whenever they are. Yeah, but we saw what he did in North Korea. When he was willing to talk, he went to North Korea, he sat down with Kim Jong-un, and he had a talk, and he's had several talks. Uh, there's no evidence that anybody has been, set, been sitting down uh, with Iran or Iranian officials, the closest we've gotten is on the latest trip uh, with, with the uh, Prime Minister of Japan. He sent a letter through the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister made a trip to Iran and, and met with uh, several officials there and delivered a letter. So I, I think there's very little on the diplomatic front. There's very little on talking face to face. Uh, and and uh, I, people are smart uh, that have said this many times in the foreign policy arena. There's nothing wrong with talking to your enemies. There's nothing wrong with talking with hostile forces because you may find common ground. The amazing thing about Iran, they still are in the agreement. They haven't broken the agreement. And that's all the testimony by military and intelligence officials before the Congress and out in public from what they've said. So. Um, they, 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 and the Europeans who signed on to the agreement, the Russians who were on the agreement, all the countries, they still want the agreement to move forward. Now, they agree it could be improved upon. So I don't know why we aren't at the table trying to improve upon this agreement rather than tear it up. Do you get the sense that the president um, himself is, is anxious to engage Iran militarily? Or is this the Pompeos, the John Boltons? Well, it's, it's hard to tell. I, there's no doubt that if you look at, at Bolton and Pompeo, uh, especially Bolton, his history is one of advocating uh, for regime change in Iran. Uh, he's also the one that got us into Iraq, uh, which we're still there. Uh, and, and everybody knows, I mean, the American people have concluded that what we did in Iraq was a mistake. So um, Bolton is a neocon. He's, he believes, I think, the only tool in the toolbox is our military and going to war, uh, which I think uh, people are sick and tired of having another uh, forever war in the Middle East. And so I, I hope the president doesn't listen to them. He pulled them back a little bit in Japan when it seemed like it was getting close to conflict, but it, we don't know yet. And, and uh, I just, uh, I, I hope the president listens to a full array of experts on this area because this, this could be, uh, Iran is three times as large as Iraq and it has a thousands of years of history in that area. And if you're going into a conflict there, it's gonna be bigger than anything we've ever seen. Do you, um, you mentioned North Korea. Um, 
North Korea has some nuclear capability. Um, and the president, to some extent, has sat down with them. Um, do you think that's kind of behind what Iran is seeing here as it's reading the tea leaves? They're saying, well, if we get a nuclear weapon, this is security for us, even no. if we have no intent to use it. And I, go ahead. I, I agree, Matt. I, I think um, if you look at, at some of our foreign policy moves, uh, here you had uh, Gaddafi in Libya give up a nuclear weapon, and the next thing you know, Allied forces came in and, and took him out. And so the lesson isn't uh, give up your nuclear weapons. The lesson is get a nuclear weapon and then you can negotiate. And, and we should be using a wide array of tools in our toolbox to send the message that we're for diplomacy, we're for trying to bring peace in a region, and then only if you get uh, the most extreme circumstances do you uh, use military force. Um, in the, in the run-up to uh, Iraq, we heard a lot about yellow cake. Um, in fact, Valerie Plame, who's running for the seat you used to hold, was deeply involved in, in at least that side of the story. Um, is there a, a credibility gap um, for the U.S. now as we try to make our case to the rest of the world that you know, that, that boat that was pulling alongside the, the crippled tanker, you know, was in fact the Revolutionary Guard and not a false flag operation. I mean, does the rest of the world believe us? I, I think there's a real credibility gap. I, I don't have any doubt about that, especially when the news story that's talking uh, about, this is recent breaking news, is, is the, the United States is saying it's the Revolutionary Guard the owner of the ship is saying, no, it wasn't a mine. It, it was some object above ground coming uh, at us. And so here, the people that were involved in the incident even disagree. That's why it's so po important that you do, if you're going into war, that our amendment basically says, let's, let's have a full discussion of this, of what the benefits are, what are the downsides? What does the intelligence tell us? I mean, presidents, if they want to go to war, have to make their case to the American people. They, you don't do it on a small little incident. And we, things have gone badly when we've done that. Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam was a small, was a small little dispute with an American ship and others. And we used that to, to get into a war. Uh, we, we, we need to be more deliberative when, when it comes to using military force. And it's not to say uh, it, that we don't have the best military in the world, best trained military, they're equipped very well, but they're, they're just one tool in the toolbox. And, and regime change, I don't think, is a way to, to carry out foreign policy to all of a sudden declare with leaders around the world, however they got there, we're, we're going to take you out because we don't like you as a leader. I mean, we should be working with countries to try to improve democracy and improve human rights situations around the world. That's what people have looked up to us for, and that's what the United States of America, I think, is all about. We um, here are going to do our best to get this up online so people can see it right away. It'll air on, on Friday evening. Um, who knows what's going to happen between now and then? Does it feel like we're close to some sort it, of it, conflict? It, it feels like we are... We are right on the edge. We, we have troops, their troops, our troops, right up against each other. Just a small miscalculation uh, could get us into a hostility situation. And then we've seen that in, in the past. That gets us further and further down the road. And then the next thing you know, we've had, we already have a plan that's being discussed of 120,000 American forces that could go into the region. And both sides are just right at the brink of war, I think. Um, lastly, we just have about a minute left here, but I wanted to ask you, do we, um, you know, say, say you get the, um, uh, the requirement from the Senate um, and, and that the House goes along that the president has to check in. Do yeah. you feel like that conversation happens in a slower fashion than it did back in October of, of 2002 or even on September 14th when it was the authorization of use of military force, September 14, 2001, One. against terrorists. Right. Does this right. conversation happen slower or do you feel See, like we're too close now? Well, I, I, if we can pass our amendment, 
I think what will happen is a deliberative process that the American people want and they need to know whether or not we should go into war. I mean, the discussion I hear from New Mexicans as I travel the state, and some of these, as, a, as I've said, are, are where young people have been serving and their parents are concerned about them. Uh, do we want to be fighting another war? I mean, we're in Afghanistan now. Uh, we're, we're still in Iraq, and there are hostilities and, and uh, uh, things that are going on where our troops are in danger. We're in other countries around the world uh, where we're, we're doing a counterterrorism force. Um, do we, on top of all these things we're carrying out, want to start another war with a major force in the Middle East, a country of 80 million people with a long history? Um, and they say, I haven't fully researched it, but Iran has said, we've never first been the aggressor in a war. You know, they had a war back in the 80s between Iraq and Iran. Guess which side we took? We were on the side of Iraq. So you can understand, you should always try to put yourself in the framework and try to think as part of your analysis, what does your opponent uh, think about you and your actions? And so that's what worries me is, is that we're, we're, we're right on the brink, we're right close to each other, we're all armed up. Uh, a mistake could get us into a war, and we shouldn't ever have that. We should have the debate like was intended by the founders of the Constitution. Congress allows war uh, to go forward, and, and after debate and after the involvement of the American people. Senator Tom Udall, thanks for your time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt. Great to be with you today. You too. Um,